with the Yoho Ho It's Tale of the Toaster and welcome to another discussion video on Inazuma 11 or perhaps a buying guide if you're still looking to get into the series' games for the first time. That's because Inazuma 11 likes to take inspiration from the Pokemon series, shall we say, and usually has two different versions of the same game, like for example Inazuma 11 2 Firestorm and Inazuma 11 2 Blizzard. This is where I would hold copies of the game, but I don't actually keep them in this house. But I wanted to make an all-in-one video. Instead of just talking about it gradually over the course of my Let's Plays like I usually do, I wanted an all-in-one guide to say what are the differences between the two games and which one conclusively is better if there is a preference or does it just come down purely to what you as a personal player would prefer. So let's get right into it with the first game. And you might be thinking to yourself, the first game? That was the only Inazuma game that didn't come in two different versions. But what if I told you you were wrong about that? Because yes, it doesn't have two Pokemon style different versions of the game, but there are still two playable versions of Inazuma 11. One, namely, I'm assuming when doing this video, of course, that you're going to play the English language release, but you can either play the DS game that was released in English back in 2011, or you can play the 3DS eShop version that was released in America and Europe in 2014. Everywhere except the United Kingdom anyway, they really just wanted you to keep playing it on the DS, so it specifically didn't come out in the UK, but everywhere else in Europe and for the first time America got it on the 3DS. So they were a couple years apart, one is a DS version and one is a 3DS version, but would you believe the DS version is actually the significantly better one. It's because the 3DS version was ripped from a Japanese compilation of the first three games called Inazuma 11 1, 2, 3, and they made the 3DS eShop version based on that, meaning it still was like a true-to-form port of the first game in its like most primitive state, copying across the original sprites from the first game, and any new features that were introduced for the European release of the DS game about three years after it first came out in Japan were not carried across. That means that the DS version has extra content in the form of a post-game competition route, something that would be a staple of future games. It has the ability to go into the settings and auto-run, which isn't there in the original DS release. It removes one of the game-breaking glitches, and then the only actual point of difference is the 3DS version will have American voice acting with some of the Danganronpa cast, while the DS version will have more local British style voice acting. The graphics are kind of the same between the both. They didn't improve the graphics quality for the 3DS, but you do get the widescreen perks of being on a 3DS instead of a DS. But at the end of the day, the DS game is better because it has more content. Oh, but did I mention that the Nintendo eShop is down, so you now can't even buy the 3DS version of Inazuma 11 anyway. So at this point, you have to play on DS. So it's a good job it is the better version. Which brings us to Inazuma 11 2, which released both with the Firestorm version and the Blizzard version. And even for early on, this is probably the case where it's the most personal preference out of all of the different versions. As we go further on with this video, we generally come to the conclusion that there is ultimately a better version to choose. But with Firestorm and Blizzard, they are almost exactly the same game. It was a really weird idea to introduce the two versions of Inazuma games with this version and then do almost nothing with it. But there are still differences, so we'll break them down. So the game's titles, logos, box art, all of that kind of imply that one game, Firestorm, is going to focus on Axel Blaze, while the other one, Blizzard, is going to focus on the new character, Sean Frost. And that is, to an extent, true. They did put a slight difference in the games where if you're playing Firestorm, Axel will level up quicker, while if you're playing Blizzard, Sean will level up quicker. But it's nothing more than that. They don't have, like, unique dialogue in each game and there's nothing to stop you from getting both to level 100 eventually anyway. It's just a very slight difference that you probably didn't even know about until I mentioned it here. Rather, the difference mainly comes down to the one post-game exclusive team, 
in each version of the game, which is a staple that carries across to every subsequent pair of Inazuma 11 games. In Firestorm, there is a post-game super boss called Prominence, while in Blizzard, there's a post-game super boss called Diamond Dust. They're both alien teams as part of Alias Academy, but ultimately, they're as good as each other. Again, when we go further into this video, we might we might see from time to time one might be more valuable than the other, but here, it is literally a case of, do you prefer fire or do you prefer ice? Because just like the names of the games, that is what the teams focus on. The captain of one is Torch, the other is Gazelle. They'll both be recurring characters in the next game as well, but they're still equally as important to each other. So it genuinely just comes down to whether you prefer fire and ice. I will say that when the two teams merge into the team of Chaos, if you link the two games together, Torch from Prominence and the goalkeeper Grent from Prominence both do go on that team. So that does mean that Prominence is a little more biased in its representation when the teams merge. You could say it's a little bit more canon that way, but it's just splitting hairs. The only other things to be really aware of are in terms of recruitable exclusive characters, you can only recruit the manager Nelly Ryman as a playable character in Firestorm, and then Sylvia Woods is only recruitable in Blizzard. Additionally, if I remember correctly, I think there's one very small extra scene with each of those managers, depending on the version that you're playing, which means that because Nelly Ryman is more so the canon uh, partner to Mark Evans than Sylvia is, I guess that makes Firestorm a little closer to the truth, but it's one scene, so <laughs> don't worry about it. There are two more exclusive characters deep within the post-game recruitables, nothing story related, but there are actually two characters of Canon Evans, the great-grandson of Mark Evans, who will have an actual story role in the next game, and then there's Scion Blaze, the cousin of Axel Blaze, who never has any story relevance. Um, but you'd think Scion would be exclusive to Firestorm, but you'd be wrong. He's exclusive to Blizzard for some reason, and then Cannon Evans is exclusive to Firestorm, and they both have one competition route team with a bunch of other exclusive funny characters applied to it. You could say that because Cannon becomes a major character in the next game and therefore is a lot easier to obtain in it, you might want to use this as a chance to use Scion in the post-game, but there's no real point dragging this out any further because it's genuinely a 50-50. There is no uh, preference of game. Unless we look at the moves, where there's two Hisatsu moves exclusive to each game, Blizzard lets you get Double Tornado, which is Fire Tornado and Bat Tornado together, and also one of the most obscure moves of all time in Leaping Thunder. Meanwhile, Firestorm lets you get Twin Boost F, which is Twin Boost plus Fire Tornado, and then Spectacle Crash. Willie Glass's signature move that I'm going to dive into the ball with my glasses and crash it into the back of the net. I'm sure it's in Willie's level up moveset for both, probably, but as a move manual, you can only get it in Firestorm. And honestly, that's like the only conclusive thing, saying Firestorm's the better game. But we'll leave it for an Azuma 11 too, because they are almost exactly the same. Just say whether you prefer fire or ice. Which brings us to Inazuma 11 3, which is the easiest one to answer in the whole video because you should be playing Team Ogre Attacks. It is not close because this was the only time in Inazuma 11's history where they actually experimented with making a third definitive game. Usually we just get a Pokemon Diamond and a Pokemon Pearl, whereas for Inazuma 11 3 they made a Diamond, a Pearl and a Platinum. This is the third version that brings the best of both worlds together and adds a little bit more on top. It doesn't add a huge amount extra compared to the previous games, but it's still clearly got the most content out of the three. This includes a whole extra area in the game set in the future, and an extra little mini-boss area as well. A whole extra plotline revolving around Canon Evans, who you this time get as a guaranteed recruit at the end of his story. The villain's Team Ogre, who attack. All of the plot points from the movie about that game are in there, including some of its exclusive special moves, which includes three of the moves that were seen in the movie. Prime Legend is a shot, Maximum Fire is a shot, and Omega the Hand is a saving move for Mark. 
those are not in Lightning Bolt and Bomb Blast, and that is the first time I've mentioned the name of Lightning Bolt and Bomb Blast because they're genuinely just not even in consideration. All of Team Ogre's moves are brand new as well. There's a tournament match mode, which is a brand new feature to fight extra teams and get some exclusive rewards off the back of it. There's even Ogre Premium Link to get Clone Penguin or Clone Death Zone, depending on which version you're linking it with. The main thing here is that exclusive to Lightning Bolt is a team called Apostles from the Sky, a team of angels, while Bomb Blast has a team of devils called Devil Army Z. Those were the main exclusive points of the post game in those games, but then in Team Ogre Attacks it lets you play against them both and their whole merged team of the Dark Angels at the end. There is one little facet of Lightning Bolt and Bomb Blast that remains exclusive though, so let's still go over that and then we'll break down which is the better of the two if, for any reason, you can't play Team Ogre Attacks. So Lightning Bolt and Bomb Blast both put a bit of extra emphasis on one of the captains of the opponent teams throughout the story, and that made the decision really hard for me when I was choosing which version of the game to play, because I read online that Lightning Bolt focuses on a guy called Paolo Bianchi, or Fideo in Japanese, while Bomb Blast focuses on a guy called Hector Helio, or Rokoko, and I just sat there thinking, who are these guys? But if you are familiar with them, then it does come down to personal preference once again. Do you want the Italian captain, or the Little Gigantes captain? I would say that although I personally prefer Paolo Bianchi as a character, I do think that the little interjected extra cutscenes of Hector Helio helps a lot, because you do see quite a bit of Dave Evans, his coach and Mark's granddad, in the process of those scenes, and it mainly just serves to actually make Hector Helio a bit less out of nowhere. He actually has some lore building in Bomb Blast that isn't there in Lightning Bolt, because Paolo Bianchi you fight kind of in the middle of the story, and he has plenty of surrounding scenes to let you know all about his character anyway, whereas Hector Helio kind of comes out of nowhere as near enough the final boss of the game, and that's why it helps to be introduced to him a little earlier, which will only happen in Bomb Blast. But still play Team Ogre Attacks. Just for the sake of being complete though, I'll read my notes because Lightning Bolt has the following exclusive move manuals of Grand Fire and The Dawn, two very good moves, but they all still belong in Axel and Xavier's level at moveset regardless. It also has Double Jaw, from Little Gigantes exclusive and the Fire Element version of Fire Blizzard, but it's still monumentally difficult to unlock anyway. And then in Bomb Blast, you get moves, move manuals for Tiger Storm, Grand Fenrir, which does not belong to any of your actual story players. You get the, the Air version of Fire Blizzard, but again, still very hard to get. And finally, X Blast is kind of outdoing Double Jaw. You get Hector Helio's shooting move, but that's not enough to say that either Lightning Bolt or Bomb Blast should be really on the radar. It does just kind of mean that of the two, I would say Bomb Blast is probably the better game based on the move manuals it gives you, the extra scenes revolving around Hector Helio, even if you do prefer Paolo Bianchi as a character like I do. And also Devil Army Z is just a lot cooler than Apostles from the Sky. You can tell that when they merge to become Dark Angels, it's the Devil Army Z guy that becomes the captain. They've got the Devil Army Z keeper. It's their plot at the end of the day to take it over. So there is actually quite a definitive ranking of Team Ogre Attacks top, Bomb Blast second, Lightning Bolt last. Now we get to move on to the first of the Inazuma 11 Go games, and this is probably the most important decision that you will make when choosing between any Inazuma 11 game, because this is the first time it will actually impact your experience when playing future Inazuma 11 games. Specifically, this game has yet another exclusive post-game super boss for Light, that is a team called Eternal Light, captained by Bylong, and for Shadow, it is a team called Ancient Darkness, captained by Tezcat. Now, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, you will know that Bylong is actually my second favourite character in the whole series, but that is purely a personal thing. I'm not going to take that into account when saying which might be overall the better version. In fact, I'm actually kind of going to do the opposite, because I know that Bylong really appeals to me on personal grounds, 
but this is the first time where you actually get introduced to those captains in interjected cutscenes throughout the main story, and the Bylong story focuses on his rivalry with Victor as a part of Fifth Sector, while Arian and Tezcat are the other pairing in Shadow that have this completely unique story about sacrifice on a uninhabited football island instead, and it's just way less generic and generally perceived to be the better story of the two by most of the players. In return, when the two teams do merge to become Zero, this is their kit, they do put more emphasis onto Bylong's team. Bylong is the captain and his goalkeeper is also the goalkeeper of the squad. Every time we get one of these teams, it's always an even number of players from both, but the goalkeeper and the captain are kind of the two most notable, and that guy over there gets to be the captain, so it's definitely in Eternal Light's favour there. But I think the main thing that swings it is the fact that when you play the next game in Azuma 11 Go Chrono Stones, Tezcat is actually a part of the main story for a chapter, and if you played Go Light and then saw Tezcat in the next game, they kind of expect you to know who he is, and why would you if he wasn't in your game? That <laughs> doesn't really make sense. I know that I played Light first, so when I played Chrono Stones, and they dropped this guy called Tezcat on me, and Arian's all like, Tezcat, it's good to see you again! I just thought, have I forgotten this guy? No, I genuinely hadn't seen him. Does Bylong have a role in Chrono Stones, however? Yes, absolutely, but only in one of them. You see, Bylong and his team is exclusive to Go Light, and then within Chrono Stones, he's an exclusive again. So we'll go over that properly in the next segment of the video, but Bylong has a major role in Chrono Stones, but only in Thunder Flash. If you're playing Wildfire, Bylong will not be in the story. So generally, if you buy Go Light, it's a good idea to then play Thunder Flash for Chrono Stones. Whereas if you play Go Shadow for Go One, you then probably want to move on to Chrono Stones Wildfire. Essentially, the game you choose here will probably influence which one you're going to play next. So, so far I've kind of been in Go Shadow's favour, but there's actually quite a few things that swing it the other way, because this is the game with the most exclusive stuff per version so far. Namely, your coach Mark Evans has a different wife, depending on which version of the game you're playing. Absolutely wild concept, I never expected them to do this. But if you're playing Go Light, Mark is married to Nelly, who you're familiar with from the first three games. Whereas if you're playing Go Shadow, he'll instead be married to Camellia Travis, or Cam Cam, who was introduced in Inazuma 11.3. Both of those characters are still in the game, but they have an opposite role to each other. So if you're playing light, Nelly will be Mark's wife, while Camellia Travis is doing some other role within the game, and then vice versa if you're playing Go Shadow. Cam Cam will be Mark's wife, but then Nelly will still be involved with taking down Fifth Sector, but it's a smaller role than if she was the spouse. So if you prefer Nelly or Cam Cam, then you can pick the game that will suit your preferences better there, but the main thing that kind of tips it more objectively to light here is that in the anime adaptation, they essentially said Nelly is the true uh, version of events here. She is the canon wife of Mark. Mark does not marry Camellia in the anime. He only marries Nelly. So that means that Go Light, in addition to Bylong's kind of greater emphasis in Eternal Light, Nelly is the thing that truly makes you say that Light is the more canon experience of the two. Though again, I also say that if you play Light, you're probably going to play Thunder Flash, and Thunder Flash is the less canon version of Chrono Stones, as we'll get to. The other big thing is that some adult members of Inazuma National from Inazuma 11.3 also have a subplot within Go Light or Go Shadow. If you're playing Go Light, then you get to focus on Xavier Foster, with some interjection from my actual favourite character, Jordan Greenway. Again, you can see why I went with Light, considering Bylong and Jordan are my two favourite characters, and they're both exclusive to Light. But Go Shadow actually gets a few more characters involved with its subplot, namely Nathan Swift is the main focus of Go Shadow, but he also has Caleb Stonewall and Jack Wallside appearing alongside him in different scenes. 
There is actually one more exclusive team in each version of the game as well, with a little bit of dialogue surrounding them. Essentially, there's a team called Southern Claw, who appear in the desert within Go Light, and there's also a team called Northern Fang, who appear in one of the ice routes in the post-game of Go Shadow. There is no preference as to which of these is better, it's just good knowing that it's there. You could at this point even break things down to the opening songs at this point, and low-key, Go Shadow's opening song is a lot better, but that is not something you should be basing your decision off. Ultimately, I would say watch the Chrono Stone section as well, because if you've got a strong preference of which of those to play, it might retroactively decide which version of Go 1 you want to play. I would say that Go Light is a little truer to the canon, while Go Shadow has the advantage that the Tezcat storyline is probably a little more interesting than the Bylong one, despite my absolute love for Bylong. Just for the sake of being complete, we'll also go over the exclusive special moves and fighting spirits. I don't think this is really an influencer at all in which is the better game, but just to say it, out come the notes. The exclusive move manuals of Go Light are White Hurricane, God Hand V, Mystic Mist, Hey Presto, and Sidewinder, whereas for Go Shadow it is Black Ash, Capable Hands, Hunter's Net, Sonic Shot, and for some reason Flurry Dash, even though that's also available as a random team drop in Go Light anyway, so that's not even a true exclusive and it's not even a good move. Then finally the Spirits. In Light you have Bylong Spirit White Wyvern alongside the Defender Judge and a really cool Void type forward called Pendragon. Meanwhile in Shadow you get Tezcat Spirit Black Butcher as well as the Defender with the Guns, Trigger and the Inferno Fist Man himself Demogorgon. There's also some exclusive special tactics, Godspeed in Light and Dark Thunder in Shadow, but they're both useless. So this ultimately comes down to either your favourite wife for Mark, your favourite returning member of Inazuma National, or who you think you're going to prefer out of Tezcat and Bylong. So let's continue that discussion into Inazuma 11 Go Chrono Stones, the sequel to that game, because this is the first time that the version of the game you play actually determines who you'll be using throughout the story. For all of the original trilogy, it pretty much only affected the post game. Then Go kind of introduced the idea that you get version exclusive scenes before beating the game, but that's all they were, scenes. They didn't actually affect the gameplay until you'd beaten the game. But now, here in the main team of Inazuma 11 Chrono Stones, you will get a different member of your team depending on which version of the game you bought. So if you bought Thunder Flash, you will get Bylong as a member of your actual team, while if you bought Wildfire, you'll get a character that you're more familiar with from the main story of Go 1 called Soul Daystar, the guy with the Irish accent. This is a pretty bum deal for the people who played Go Shadow because if you get Bylong on your team at that point, they again kind of expect you to know who he is, and you just won't unless you watch the movie. However, Chrono Stones is the game that made Bylong my favourite character. Once he is on the team, he's very funny, especially in the inner link. He's got great moves to choose from. I didn't actually care about him that much because of Go 1, it's exclusively Chrono Stones that made me like him. However, Soul Daystar is also one of the most popular characters in the entire Go trilogy, and once again, just like we were saying, Light is the more canon version of events, thanks uh, as according to the anime, because it makes Nelly the wife of Mark. This time, if you're watching the anime of Chrono Stones, it is ultimately Soul Daystar, who they actually add to the main Ryman team, and not Bylong, who does not appear in the anime at all. You may already have a preference of which of those two characters you actually like more, on just a preference basis, but if you're asking the question of who is the better player, it depends what point of the game you're asking about, basically. I would say that Soul Daystar is a much more useful member of the team during the main story, where you're actually guaranteed to have him, because his stamina is a lot higher. By long, when you're trying to use him for all of the gimmicks like Mixy Max and bringing out spirits, you'll find that all of his gimmicks wear off really quickly because he doesn't have the stamina to keep them out for very long. 
he has like a match where you're required to bring out his Mixy Max and then it pretty much disappears as soon as you've got it just because of the way he was coded. And generally the chapter that does revolve around either Bylong or Soul is much more made to suit Soul's personality than it is around Bylong's. But in return, I would say within the post game, Bylong has the most potential there. He's got a much higher kickstart and he's generally one of the best forward options in the game. But that is not to say that Soul Daystar is bad either, because at the end of the day, both of them will have access to a move called Thundertaker, which might be the best move in the game, and the actual power behind your kick of it doesn't really matter that much. It's a good move because of its effect on the goalkeeper's stun gauge, which will be the same no matter who you're using. So, although both characters are forwards and Bylong is better at being a forward, Soul Daystar is perhaps more versatile. They're ultimately both really, really good though. And that is ultimately the only thing that really matters when choosing which version of Chrono Stones you want to play. There's other stuff, like there's some post-game exclusive parallel stones cutscenes, just to give you a few couple of gags to watch, where thunder flashes are a lot funnier, but they're both they're all on my YouTube channel anyway. You can just watch those videos and Thunder Flash, I would say, has a better opening song as well, but that doesn't really matter either. As ever, there are some version exclusive super bosses at the very end of the post game. In Thunder Flash, you would be playing against a team called Vamp Tim, a team of vampires captained by Desmodus Dracul. Whereas if you're playing Wildfire, you'll play against a team of werewolves called Luna Howl, captained by Wolfram Vulpine. Ultimately, though, I mean, I can't say I'm especially big on werewolves or vampires. If you've got a strong preference between the two concepts, then sure, that might decide which version of the game you buy, but honestly, Chrono Stones has the most intensive and difficult post-game plot anyway, to the point where you might not even see those teams in the first place. So, considering they're both equally as good as each other, I really would not use that as a factor unless you've got a very strong preference, and there's no returning of the Xavier Foster exclusive scenes or the Mark's wife. Mark's wife is not in this game as a result of trying to make this playable for whoever played the last game. It basically comes down to Bylong, who's a better forward but less canonically accurate, or Soul Daystar, who's been a more important character up to this point and is still really, really good. The story is kind of built to suit him more, but Bylong because he suits it less, it gives him a chance to be funny, so I don't really care. I would say again, if you played Go Light, then it makes sense to keep Bylong in your experience and move on to play Thunder Flash. And most definitely, more importantly, if you did not play Go Light, if you played Go Shadow, then it would be very weird to play Thunder Flash afterwards. Before we move on, we'll go over the exclusive moves, which again is such a non-factor in decision making, but I want to cover them just in case. In Thunder Flash, the exclusive moves are Bloodsucker Bite, which is from Desmodus Dracul, Dragon Driver from Bylong, an exclusive goalkeeper move called Cyclone, which was built to be a version exclusive, and then there's also randomly exclusive move manuals for Goopy Gloopy Goo and Spin Out, which are generally on other players anyway. Then for Wildfire, you've got Wolfram's move, Werewolf Howl, you've got Soul Daystar's brand new move, Solar Nexus. The exclusive goalkeeping move of this game is White Hole. Both Cyclone and White Hole are used by the same character in the post game, but they just gave him two moves so that they could have an extra version exclusive. And then finally, there are manuals for Overnight Fortress and Heartbeat that you almost definitely don't need. <laughs> no exclusive tactics, but in terms of spirits, in Thunder Flash you get Glenra from Dracul, you get Argentia, a wind type forward, and Raiden, an earth type defender with the rare move Tortoise Shield. Whereas in Wildfire you get Dire Wolf, the midfielding fire element one of uh, Wolfram, you get Asura, the earth type forward, and perhaps the best one of all, there is the Wind Element Defender Kukulkan with an extremely under the radar move called Feather Duster. So that's all. The shortest way I can put it is that Wildfire is a more accurate experience, while Thunder Flash is a funnier experience. 
To close out the video is Inazuma 11 Go Galaxy, Big Bang and Supernova. And weirdly, this video right here is not necessarily the best place to make that decision. Rather, I've got some counterpart videos from my actual Let's Play, which will be in the end slate and in end cards up here. But essentially, the main thing that decides whether or not you should be playing Big Bang or Supernova, it comes at the end of Chapter 5, where after, for all of the story up to this point, you're using brand new characters on your team, they give you the opportunity to recruit 11 players from the past to add to your squad for the rest of the game, and then you can use them in the post-game. So none of those characters are exclusive to those versions of the game in the long run, but only in Supernova or Big Bang can you get each one of them before beating the game. Now the main thing to be aware of here is that Big Bang has access to two characters here within Chapter 5 who are technically available in Supernova, but their recruitment conditions are so difficult you're almost guaranteed to never do it. One of those characters is Quentin Shinquidea, the goalkeeper from Go One, and the other one, of course, is Bylong. He's here again, can you see why I put this kit on? This is oddly a reverse of Chrono Stones, where Tezcat from Go Shadow was actually forcibly in the main story of Chrono Stones. This time in Go Galaxy, Tezcat is not in the story at all, but Bylong is. Although I would say Tezcat's story in Chrono Stones felt a lot more weird without knowing who he is, whereas Bylong is just ultimately being a big, brutal captain of a football team, so you don't need to know who he is. Um, for that one, but over the course of this video, I think you do <laughs> know him at this point. That is basically to say, if you want to get all of these players, then you will have an easier time playing Big Bang, because it will save you the process of recruiting Bylong and Quentin Shinquidea manually, because their recruitment condition is having all 100 unique item drops from teams throughout all competition routes and random encounters that you use for pal packing. It's an absurd thing to ask. Just getting one for certain characters is hard enough, and these guys need a hundred. It means that they are possible to get in Supernova, but it will be the absolute last thing you do in the entire game, versus Big Bang, where you can have them right away. But there are still other characters to talk about, so to bring up the list one more time, if you are playing Big Bang, during the main story at the end of Chapter 5, you can recruit anyone from Aphrodite, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Canon Evans, Paolo Bianchi, Joseph King, Wolfram Volpine, Bylong, Chinquidea, Mark Kruger, Torch, Dave Quagmire, David Samford, Hurley Kane, Austin Hobbs, and Victoria Vanguard. Meanwhile, if you're playing Supernova, you can have Sol Daystar, who is once again an exclusive, Bash Lancer from Team Ogre, one of the better strikers in the whole game, I would say, Edgar Partinus, Caleb Stonewall, Eric Eagle, Xavier Foster, Jordan Greenway, yes, they made Bylong and Jordan Greenway exclusive to different games to each other to separate my two favourite characters, Bellatrix, Dodge, Hector Helio, Simeon Ape, that's a pretty significant one, Tezcat, Kevin Dragonfly, Gazelle, Darren Lachance, Archer Hawkins, Desmodus Dracul, and Njord Snow. That will be almost entirely the decider for which version of the game you play. Again, slight edge to Big Bang if you're looking to get more characters in the long run anyway. However, there are still other factors to the game, and when it comes to the post-game exclusive teams, this time simply called Big Bang and Supernova, I'm going to keep it brief. Supernova's a lot cooler. They tried with Big Bang, but Supernova is just more entertaining, not just in terms of character designs, but in terms of their actual plot leading up to the match. It's... I don't want to go into too much detail because that's spoiling the plot, but the Supernova plot, just take my word for it, is much more interesting than the Big Bang one, and all of the team's exclusive moves are much more interesting as well. Namely, they've got the goalkeeping move Sacrificial Switch, which is one of the funniest moves in the series history, 
And then also the shooting move orbital drive is really cool as well and nothing in Big Bang compares to moves like that. The only thing really in Big Bang's favour when you're looking at the version exclusive teams is that Big Bang's exclusive captain is more plot relevant before beating the game in a weird way that I can't really explain properly without spoiling things but it doesn't actually matter he's still gonna have that role in both versions of the game and then when you do play the post-game story just kind of enjoy them in isolation and I would say Supernovas is better. This is also the least that exclusive moves and other things like fighting spirits have ever mattered because there are two exclusive move manuals in Big Bang. It's got Copy Cut and Dry Blow, whereas Supernova has Defense Equation and Menace Elbow. That information is irrelevant. In terms of opening songs, that's a bit of an interesting one because Supernova's song is a banger. It is so good, but it's in the anime anyway, whereas Big Bang's song is still good as well and it's not in the anime, that's essentially a game exclusive song. And finally, instead of exclusive fighting spirits, you get exclusive totems, but totems are infinitely worse than fighting spirits anyway, so it simply doesn't matter. Big Bang gives you Griff Bang, Flamey, Goliger, Magnetas, and Univolt, whereas Supernova gives you Dragnova, Brokias, Dandoral, Saranaja, and Vyras. That's the first time I've ever said any of those in my life. That's how irrelevant they are. So basically, it all comes down to the Chapter 5 recruits. Please do watch my character exclusive bios if you want to make a more informed decision on who you would want during your main team. If you're more interested in the end result of trying to get everyone, Big Bang will make it easier. But Supernova's other exclusive features within the post game make it much better than Big Bang in that regard, in my opinion. I would say that Chapter 5 stuff matters more, so that's why I personally went for Big Bang, but also I mainly did that just because I was trying to go with every game that had Bylong as an exclusive at this point. I played Light into Thunder Flash into Big Bang. This is one where I think there's a legitimate case for Supernova being better if it happens to suit your preferences with the Chapter 5 recruits. But that's it, a comprehensive breakdown of all the version exclusive things. At the end of the day, you're still playing the same game, no matter which version you play. It doesn't matter that much, but everyone's got to make the decision at some point of which version of the game they're actually going to play. So if you haven't made that decision yet, hope this helped, and I will see you in another video. TTFN.